And welcome to Jay Moore's New Biz Entrepreneur Series, uh, featuring accomplished entrepreneurs from a variety of industries throughout the greater Baltimore region. The Jay Biz Entrepreneur Series is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm specializing in mergers and acquisitions, startup and entrepreneurial law, intellectual property and technology transactions, and procurement. At Nemphos Brow, the client always comes first, working with companies throughout the entire life cycle of business. Learn more at nemphosbrow.com. I'm Gary Stein. I'll be your host. And today we're with Steve Rutkovich, the founder and CEO of Choice Cybersecurity, located in Owings Mills, Maryland, a true leader in cybersecurity solutions for both business and homes. And a quick did you know, not so fun fact, maybe, Steve, that nearly 60 million Americans and 61% of American businesses are impacted by cyber attacks. You probably do know that. How do you help or help us? Well, these cyber attacks are growing, and I think we're just scratching the surface of it. What's happening is the bad guys are getting – their tools are getting better and better. Mm. And the good guys, us good guys, have to keep up. And as soon as we kind of, you know, get things up to par, the bad guys, you know, have new new techniques. So uh, the key is really being proactive and really understanding risk. And once you understand the risk, then you can actually put um, technologies in place – training technologies, policies to actually prevent these attacks from happening. So what we're seeing is the key is really getting visibility and clarity of a business and their data and their uh, hardware, firewalls, understanding the risk entirely. And then once you do that, then you can pre- prevent these attacks from happening. So, so you talk about the bad guys having better stuff and the good guys having better stuff. Those numbers that we just talked about, the 61% of businesses, is that number increasing, maintaining, or declining? So I just kind of saw some numbers that came out, but what's happening is it seems like it, it happens in waves, but this year the ransomware attacks are like probably mm. doubled. I mean, it's up in the 70s. Um, because the ransomware has gotten, it's morphed into a really complicated kind of, um, to actually prevent it. So it's getting more complex, so it's hard to prevent. And we're seeing a a giant uptick in that. We're seeing um, less attacks on servers and more attacks on the workstation or the endpoint that actually launches these cryptos that actually lock down the files, and then they ask for ransom. And in order to get the information back, you've got to pay the ransom to get your key. Okay. So we're going to talk more about that, but I wanted to back up, actually, if that's okay. Um, This is an entrepreneur series, and I think what's really of interest to people um, over and above what you actually do is who you are and what your journey has been like. And we had a chance to warm up before a little bit. You told me that you uh, became an entrepreneur at the ripe old age of 21. So take us back there and what motivated you to do that, and let's move forward from there. All right. So actually, I'm from Baltimore. I was born and raised in Baltimore. I grew up in Randallstown. And my dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, He had a place in Lexington Market for like 35 years. So when I was growing up as early as eight years old, I actually went to the market. And I used to just observe and watch. And, you know, I used to think this is part of life. My dad was an entrepreneur. So that's kind of what I've learned. And, you know, how to watch every aspect of him running the business uh, for a number of years. So then when I went to college, I studied business and computers. Uh, When I actually started into the computer business um, back in 95, that's kind of how I got into the IT business, mm. providing outsourced services for businesses. And then in 95, kind of moved forward about 21 years, and became a managed service provider, built it up to about 40 people with about 300 customers in the Maryland, D.C. area. Um, more and more companies were having problems with the security and compliance. And I realized that, you know, everybody was kind of winging it. So then I kind of figured out a way to help companies prevent these security attacks from happening, and sold the managed services business in 2016 to my local competitor to spin off a pure play security compliance company mm-hmm. today. So, but before 95, when you were, what, 21 years old, yeah. um, what, what, what entrepreneur business did you start then? So then it was actually interesting. So actually I had back problems, actually I had back surgery out of college, and I opened a, a business called The Backstores. Hmm. And it was just orthopedic products, and I had a partner, and we had an investor, and the thing flew very, very fast, and I kind of learned everything what not to do. So hmm. the first time out of the gates was a really good experience, but it wasn't very profitable. How many years with that? 
about uh, about start to finish was about four years. Mm-hmm. And so then you were 25. Yep. And then what happened at 25? So I learned a computer business. So I got back in the computer business. That's where I was for about two years right outside of school. And then I saw that we had a large growth opportunity. So computers were just getting started. So I was actually selling micro computers against mini computers. Mm. So it's almost like the cloud today. It was kind of like the PCs were just evolving. And we could say this $30,000 PC could do the work of a $300 mini computer. And we did one and two and three. And before you knew it, you know, like dinosaurs, it didn't get extinct overnight. But over time, mini computers kind of went by the, the wayside. And microcomputers grew. So I worked for a company. It was actually called CompuCare at the time. And I learned that business for a number of years and then went on my own uh, in 95 to start Choice Technologies. Mm -hmm. So so it's interesting. You said that one of the best lessons you learned at 21 when you opened up the back store was what not to do. (laughs) I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs right now that, that may be watching that are interested in that. What are some of the things not to do? What lessons did you learn? So, you know, as you know, I've been in business for like 30 years. So what happens sometimes... Knowing what to do is really key, Mm -hmm. but often knowing what not to do is also key. So, you know, you basically do business, somebody doesn't pay you, for example, and you know next time the credit's not good. So you don't want to repeat the mistakes that you make over and over again. You want to quickly learn from your mistakes and be able to adjust quickly. Mm -hmm. That's really the best lesson. What do you think are the most important characteristics? If somebody is out there that is thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, maybe they're not happy with their corporate job or, you know, whatever job they have. What are some of the characteristics of an entrepreneur that you think may be the most important ones? Well, being an entrepreneur, you really have to understand and be good in lots of areas. And if you're not good in those areas, you have to be able to either outsource it hire for it or bring in some kind of outside vendor. You know, it used to be a, a time when, you know, you didn't have to be good in marketing and social media. So it, it's kind of like just within marketing, you have to be good at lots of different areas. So the, the challenge is that it's hard to be good in everything. So you have to really take, I think, what you're good at and what you're like, what I call your superpower or the thing you're really good at and focus to become the best at it and then hire or outsource the things around you that you're not so good at. And so that lesson that you took with the back store, you were able to apply to your, to your next business? Right. So I was able to apply that to the next business and was able to grow that to a very large, very successful company. Mm-hmm. How did your, so you started um, Choice, uh, what was the name of the company you started in 95? Choice Technologies. Cho- Choice Technologies. Yeah. How is that different from the company that you have today? So Choice Technologies, I started with one person. We did outsourced IT and then grew it to 40. So what happened is we did more or less general IT services for medical offices, law firms, accounting firms, for for pretty much service businesses. We had manufacturing. We had all kinds of businesses, about 300 clients. And we took care of everything from the servers, workstations, the Internet, to the firewalls, to the Microsoft Word. We took care of everything as far as infrastructure and kept things running, patched, updated, and basically kept the lights on. Mm-hmm. And then today, what do you do? Right. So as I evolved in that business, what was happening was, you know, in 2000, HIPAA came out for medical. And then, you know, our financial clients start getting the SEC requirements right. and FINRA. And, you know, the government contractors started getting, like, DOD requests from Lockheed. So what was happening is we were getting a combination of requests for compliance which is kind of like structure. And also we were getting calls for ransomware or attacks or brute force attacks. People were getting hacked. And we just realized that we were getting like riddled. And I was talking to my other MSPs that I was talking to in the country, they were getting riddled and everybody was kind of winging it. They really didn't have a plan for it. So we developed this process called assess, address and maintain. Hmm. It's a three step process. We start off with a risk assessment. The risk assessment's key because once you understand the risk, then you can deal with it. And then once you understand the risk, you put in the, uh, the layers of security to bring them up to an acceptable level of risk. That's how you address it. And then you can maintain it by maintaining an acceptable level of risk so the customer doesn't fall backward. So we built this process for about a year. We started rolling it out to our customers for a year with a lot of success. And then we realized we really had something because the cyber and compliance was getting huge and we realized that companies really needed this. So 
we were able to sell off the managed services. Out of the blue, actually, our competitor came to us to an acquisition. We sold the managed services, and today we're Choice Cybersecurity. We're a pure play security compliance company, uh, providing, you know, advanced cybersecurity and compliance services to you know all kinds of businesses around the world. You you mentioned MSPs earlier, yeah. managed service providers. Correct. Is that what it stands for? Yeah. yeah. So explain exactly what that is. So I live in a world of acronyms. So yeah. <laughs> if I use acronyms, just let me know. But uh, managed service provider was what happened when I first started. We were called a VAR or value added reseller, mm. and we would you know build servers and workstations for companies when networking was really just in its infancy. And then you'd sit back, and if somebody called you and said, my server crashed or my PCs weren't working, you sent the tech out to fix it, or you provide help desk services. Over the years, what we learned is if you're super proactive and you patch the machines and you do your run your backups and you do everything proactively, then if something happens, you're always ready. And so we went from kind of this hourly business where it was kind of billed by the hour to kind of a fixed fee service where you're trying to crush the hours, right, to provide these recurring revenue services and you become more of a recurring revenue model. You know, what I try to do as an entrepreneur is build businesses that do have recurring revenue because it helps you in the good and bad times. Absolutely. And it's yeah. very important. Mm-hmm. So the, the managed services business went from kind of the break fix IT hourly services into the managed services. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how we kind of morphed into that. And then from there, we went into the security compliance. A couple of quick questions back on the entrepreneur journey, and then we'll dump Go. right back into cybersecurity. You mentioned your dad had a stall in Lexington Market for, what, 30, 35 years? Yeah. Um, so obviously, he was a mentor for you. Were there any other entrepreneurial mentors that you can think of back then? <laughs> well, actually, my, my grandfather, my uncle, they were mm. all either in the market or entrepreneurs. So I used to ask a lot of questions. And I used to observe a lot. I was really always interested in business. And really, the business has the same fundamentals. No matter what business you're in, it, it really has a lot of the same similarities and fundamentals. Did you even ever entertain working for a company coming out of college? Well, I did. For the first two years, I did work for a company. They were a temperature control company just getting in the computer business. Mm-hmm. So I kind of learned from them, and then I really I had the itch and just wanted to go on my own. And I think I talked to a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, and it's almost like you, you got the itch or you uh, um, sh- sh- spookies, whatever you got. You yeah, gotta, spookies. You, you want right. to do it. You want to go off on your own. You want to do it. And I, you know, my advice to entrepreneurs out there is, you know, if you want to do it, go and do it, but you need a really good plan. Yeah. I mean, just don't wing it. Like, you want to have a really good structured plan. You want to kind of test it and make sure the market's there. And, um, you know, work your plan and uh, be able to adjust. Mm-hmm. Especially today, what I'm seeing is that because of the Internet and the fast pace of technology, it's so important to really be flexible. It's almost like you, in football, um, you have to, like, read the defense and or the the defense has to read the offense. You have to be that nimble because it keeps changing. Mm-hmm. And you almost have to anticipate the running back coming out of the backfield because things are changing so quick. So uh, my advice there is you, you have to spend some of your time as an entrepreneur, whether it's 5% or 10%, in a quiet area where you're thinking about strategy. You've always got to be thinking two or three years down the road. And you always have to have an eye toward the future and work the business today. Just for the uninitiated, by the way, the word spilkies is a Yiddish word, and it, it literally means pins and needles. Oh, yeah. yeah, but what it is taken to mean is like you're restless, right. like, like somebody's putting pins and needles in you and you're jumping around. Yeah. So you were restless because you wanted to become an entrepreneur back then. Right, and I talk to a lot of you know, young people today, and some of them want to be entrepreneurs and whatnot, and I, and I give them my advice, you know, good and bad. But when it's time, you kind of know it, Mm -hmm. and um, you just got to push forward and not look back. So let's talk about the industry for just a minute as I'm being handed a note here. Oh, yes, uh, which I will do in a second. Thank you. Um, You talk about young people, right? And cybersecurity right now is really a major, major in on college campuses there's a lot of uh you know technology obviously but a lot of thought and education going into that what are you seeing from young people today as they go into this field are they being prepared properly well you know 
in college, you learn more of the textbook. You don't really learn hands-on. Mm-hmm. So it's really a lag time between what they learn in college and by the time they get out and they get into the real world, there's actually a lag time. What it teaches them is kind of the basic fundamentals of cybersecurity and how attacks happen. But what I find is some of the guys coming out of school is like, we didn't learn this in school. We learned kind of older kind of attacks, you know, brute force attacks on a firewall. We didn't learn about this new stuff like that's taken over workstations and Frankensteining. Um, you know, people take some of these malware and whatnot and they Frankenstein and make them worse. So uh, I do see that learning and going to school is important, but I think what happens, there is somewhat of a difference between the real world and what they're learning in cyber um, in school. Which is probably the way it is for most, if not yeah. all. Uh, and, you know, I mean, hands on, I mean, you know, education is great, but hands on experience and, you know, dealing with right. people and is obviously. Uh, going to be much more uh, involved. Uh, we want to remind you that this is Jay Moore's new JBiz Entrepreneur Series, uh, featuring accomplished entrepreneurs from a variety of industries throughout the greater Baltimore region. Steve Rutkovich, the founder and CEO of Choice Cybersecurity, located in Owings Mills, is our guest. The JBiz Entrepreneur Series is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, startup and entrepreneurial law, intellectual property, and technology transactions and and procurement. Please um, learn more about them at nemphosbrow.com. Steve, let's continue on. Cybersecurity is in the news today as we speak, and I'm sure it will be. Right here in Baltimore City, the Baltimore City government has been attacked, a ransomware attack. I know you probably haven't been involved in it, but just from your experience in the business, tell us a little bit about it and maybe what we don't know that the papers are telling us. Yeah, well, first off, for every probably attack you hear in the news, there's probably a 1,000 or 5,000 you don't hear about. So, you know, the Baltimore City recent attack of the ransomware, um, you know, it's a public organization, so it becomes gets a lot of uh, media attention very quickly. Um, my opinion on that is should never happen. I mean, really, absolutely should never happen. Because what happens, the tools today are, are so good for a IT company that even if you do get hacked, you should be able to, re- able to restore quickly. So, for example, when they got hacked, the time to test your backups isn't when you need them. Mm. The time to test your backups is on a quarterly basis to make sure they work. So in, in the case of the city, the first thing you want to go to, which is your fallback, is the backup. They could have reverted back to a day or a week or even a month, but they mostly, most of their backups weren't working, and therefore they could not revert back. So there were things that happened, in my opinion, that they could have been a lot more proactive about. And... Um, you know, it, the the fallout, I think, is much larger than they ever imagined. Talk, talk a little bit about the ripple effect, because we talked about that earlier. Yeah, so, you know, I talked to a lot of people in Baltimore, and, you know, I was at a um, kind of a dinner party last week, and one of the um, people I was talking to was actually a real estate attorney here in Baltimore, and he's like, we can't do any business. The entire system shut down, and we can't do any transactions, so his business is pretty much, he can't, you know, losing money for the week because he can't do transactions in the city. I was just talking about my daughter who was going to play um, music at Mount Washington Tavern, and we're trying to schedule her. She's trying to schedule her date, and they're like, "Well, we can't schedule a date because we haven't got our entertainment license from the mm. city." So it seems everywhere I go, there's some kind of a ripple effect from it. But it's very important that all businesses and municipalities have a compliance framework, which is a structure to the security or compliance. And it also has the right resources to understand the risk and then put in basic security and compliance components. It's, it's a combination of technology, policies that people follow. What we find is that with policies, if people don't know what the policies are, then they do what they think is best. And a lot of times people click on things or what they think is best and it's not. So it's a combination of technology, policies, and awareness training. You know, tra- users have to be trained as well. So uh, when you're looking at a culture of security, it's not just in the IT department, it's really the whole business. And, you know, once you build that culture of security, it takes work up front to do, but then you just got to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And I think looking back at the city, 
you know, I just saw something that came out that they actually had a risk assessment that said the equipment was like seven years old and that somebody recommended these updates to be done and, I, you know, they just weren't done. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they need to get, get through this, which is difficult. Um, you know, people say to me, should they pay the ransom? Well, I've paid a lot of ransom. You know, I get called into some of these breaches so much around the world when an attack comes, not to my clients, but the uh, referrals that come in. And it's really simpler to negotiate some kind of a Bitcoin exchange to get that key back. Because what you don't realize is that ransom has one key and one person holds it. It's like having a lock on your car door and one person has the key and, you know, you have to get it from them. So... It probably would have been smarter to pay the ransom. You know, they I think they asked for seventy-six thousand dollars. They probably could have negotiated it down to thirty, and then paid it through Bitcoin, and the city could have been up and running within a few days. Hmm. So, from from your experience, um, are there certain types of industries or businesses, or maybe even governments, that are more likely to oh, be sure. hacked? Yeah. So we do a lot of work with defense contractors. So it's kind of interesting. The, the defense contractors were, you know. When I first started working with them, they have a really stringent NIST 171 requirement right now. So if you're like a subcontractor to make one of the stealth airplanes or something, you could be one of the contractors in the actual chain. And you have to have a pretty tight compliance. And people, you know, owners would say, why do I need this? I don't have any sensitive data. And what's interesting is what the government has figured out is that, let's say the Chinese were to hack four companies or five companies, they could put their own landing gear together. So they're, they're not so much worried about an individual company, they're worried about how things actually can get put together. Mm-hmm. So that's why they have some strategic compliance. So the government contractors um, are targets. Um, medical, because the, the medical um, records have a lot of value on the dark web. So a record could have anywhere from you know, 16 to $100 per record that could be sold on the dark web. And then the bad guys can you know, do things with medical records and also the financial inter- industry, the accounting firms and wealth management companies, anybody in the financial sector are targets. So we're seeing a huge uptick in those three areas mm-hmm. of attempts to have some kind of attacks. But again, the, the attacks that are coming out now across all business, it used to be a time where they were targeted, where somebody came in to actually do a you know, kind of a spear or target Today, the tools go out and scan for, at thousands at a time, and they look for what's called these vulnerabilities that are in software. Because software, by its very nature, nature has bugs. And what they find are these little exploits or these little um, exploits, their uh, vulnerabilities, and then the attackers see that as step one. If they can get through step one, they try to go to step two. So the key is for your business is to have a risk assessment, understand what your vulnerabilities are, button them up, and then the attackers are going down the street where it's easier prey. Right. So you want to be a hard target, not a soft target. A couple questions for you before yeah. we go. Um, what motivates you? Why, why do you get out of bed every morning? Ah, that's a good question. So I, I just really enjoy business. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I consider myself kind of a visionary, and I like to look down the road, and I like to create. So I like to create new ideas and new plans and watch them happen and come to fruition. Why do you do what you do specifically? Well, the reason I do what I do is I just saw just a huge – well, when I saw these attacks that were happening, we could be, would be called from a business. I mean, I can remember a medical office that got shut down and, you know, they had, you know, patients coming in nonstop. They couldn't, you know – see what the charts were. They couldn't see what the allergies were, what the medicine was. I would see the impact to a business when they had some kind of an attack. And I just realized there's got to be a better way. So, you know, what what really juices me up or gets me excited is being able to prevent this Mm -hmm. and not having companies be in the situation. And if they are, then we can help them out and, you know, get them back up and running quickly. What what do you like to read? So I love to read. So um, I like to read... A lot of different things, but I really like bios about people. Mm. I really, it's interesting, like to learn how people, again, have like started a business. Uh, and it, it could be any business. Like a lot of times, I'll watch like music videos and see how like a Tom Petty started, right? And how he built it. He was a real business guy. Have you ever noticed or looked back at his history? He was business from high school. He was all business, and 
he built the band, and if somebody didn't like conform to his band, he was fired, and he got somebody else in. Mm-hmm. And he just kept rolling it, and he didn't give up. So you have to have a lot of perseverance to be an entrepreneur. You know, it's funny you say that because I don't know a lot about him per- personally. I do, I do love his music, but you could tell like the style of music, the type of music. It's, it's, it's urgent. Uh, you know, a lot of it is urgent, yeah. and I think that's kind of what you described right there. He had some type of urgency about him from an early age. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you like to watch? Do you, do you like theater? Do you do you like cultural things like that? Yeah, so uh, my daughter is in the musical theater. She wants to be on Broadway. So we go to a lot of shows. So mm-hmm. um, at first I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to go to these shows. Now I'm really into it. So we love shows, um, going to shows, love seeing like musical theater. And I'd like to see the creativity. So again, it's all back to the creativity. Advice for a young entrepreneur, what would you say? So advice for a young entrepreneur is um, I think it really comes down to strategy and really having a good plan. And I think that the timing is key, and, but you'll never know if you'll be successful till you try. So when I look back, I talk to a lot of people and they're like, I wish I would have been an entrepreneur. Don't have that fear. You wanna, if you think you want to do it, you know, don't just wing it, but put a plan together and then try it. The worst thing can happen is you can go work for somebody again. That's the worst thing that can happen. But you also have to have the right resources. So a lot of times, you know, I've looked back and I've seen people get into business and they didn't have enough runway. So it always takes more money to do it and it takes longer to do it than you ever expected unless you get some kind of quick kind of lucky windfall. And most entrepreneurs actually fail that first time. Like, I'm not yeah. saying you fail, yeah, but, I w- you know, I w- the, right? The, right the I got scolded. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first time was, um, you know, again, lessons of what not to do, but I turned over a lot of rocks, mm-hmm. and those rocks were easy the second time out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Steve, it's a pleasure. Thank See you if you can accomplish that time. handshake. There okay, we go. Thanks. Steve Rutkovitz, the, chair, the founder and CEO of Choice Cybersecurity, located in Owings Mills. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very for much for your time. And this has been Jay Moore's new Jay Biz Entrepreneur Series, brought to you by Nempho Sproul, the Mid Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm. I'm Gary Stein. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.